Thank you so much. Oh, let me hit the got it button here. All right. Thank you, Mara. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is John Fries, and I'm the director of the Center for Professional Education here at UTC. We're happy to have such a large crowd with us today. I always like to give a shout out to our partners, the Chattanooga Regional Manufacturing Association, who we partner with monthly to put on, the, put on these lunch and learns. We greatly appreciate that. And I do not see Megan King on here, but we appreciate her and her support. Today, we are joined by Jason Provancha, CEO of Steam Logistics. And Jason is going to share how Steam is reimagining the way freight moves by implementing an innovative business model that leverages technology, diversity, and industry best practices to drive success. Jason is the CEO of Steam Logistics, a technology-enabled third-party logistics business based in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and additional offices in Birmingham, Minneapolis, Detroit, and Des Moines, Iowa. Founded originally in 2012 as a sister company to Access America Transport, Steam became independent in 2014 after the merger of Access America and Coyote Logistics. Since then, Steam has scaled quickly and become, been named to the Inc. 5000 list of America's fastest growing companies each of the last five years, along with its annual list of best workplaces. At Steam, Provencia primarily focuses on growth, company vision and culture, talent acquisition. Prior to Steam, he served as in executive positions at both Access America and Coyote. Also with us today, the king of cahoots himself, Mr. Chris Barnes. Chris, it's all yours. Thank you, John. Excellent introduction as well. So Jason, thanks again for investing time with us. So John right, mentioned Steam Logistics. Um, can you just take a couple minutes to tell us you know, who Steam Logistics is? The first question is, are you a 3PL? I'm, I'm approaching that from an academic side. So just tell us a little bit about who yourself, who you are. We are 3PL, and as John mentioned in the intro, we started this business originally as the international arm to Access America Transport, which those of you who are local, or maybe just who are in the logistics space would know that name. It was a very successful domestic 3PL truck brokerage uh, that we scaled over a 12-year period before merging it with Coyote Logistics, who then sold it to UPS a year later. And so Steam really began as the freight forwarding and international side of that business. And uh, once the merger happened with Coyote, it became fully independent from the Access America days. And, and uh, we've been at it ever since and spent a good number of years trying to figure out how to be a freight forwarder, which was a, a pretty tough uh, climb, but we, we ultimately figured it out. And now we think of ourselves a little bit differently. We, when we sold our original business, we were in a non-compete situation for seven years to stay out of domestic freight. And so, the early days were all focused on international ocean freight, air freight, customs compliance. And uh, over time, as that non-compete expired, we've layered in some additional services, including domestic, which was our uh, old bread and butter, and, and then also dredge services, which is, of course, moving ocean containers across uh, over the road. So um, that's the way we think about our business now is this sort of three-legged stool of international, domestic, and dredge which we think has created a, a pretty unique value proposition. And when we talk about changing the way that people think about 3PLs, we believe we're creating a bit of a new template for what a 3PL can be to be able to deliver services from uh, overseas all the way through to the you know, customer's dock. And, and that's kind of a unique place to operate from. Well, I know we could, you know, that old space, now you're, you're a, you could talk about you know, fuel costs and driver shortage and all that stuff. What I'm more interested in is, you know, because we had a pre-call, the level of detail that you're involved with, with what we call corporate social responsibility and, uh, and how focused you on you are specifically on employee development and, and those things. But, you know, in terms of diversity, uh, I know it means a lot of different things to different people, but you kind of, what impressed me is I asked you about it. You, you knew the, de the detailed numbers, the percentages and can you tell us a little bit about why that's important to you and, and what you guys yeah. are doing? Yeah, we, we had a uh, we had a moment, you know, around the time that, that George Floyd was murdered, where I think as, as an organization, and we probably were not alone in this, I think a lot of organizations began to reflect on what they were doing around diversity. And, and where we landed with that was we were a much smaller business then. I mean, we've grown, uh, you know, we have somewhere around 615 employees right now. And I think when that happened, we were probably maybe 50 or 75 or something along those lines. So we're a much smaller business. 
And we were also in the middle of a, a real redesign around our culture and some of the maxims that we run our business around. And we were really spending a lot of time preparing for what we are now, which was how do we scale our values and culture as we grow this business? And let's make sure that it's by design and not just by default. And so we were already having those conversations. And what we ultimately arrived at was our thought process around diversity was entirely intellectual. We intellectually understood that diversity is important for a number of reasons, but it wasn't actually showing up. We weren't executing on those beliefs in a way that was showing up in, in how our team was comprised. And so we got pretty serious about sort of deconstructing that process and beginning to think a little differently about what we wanted to look like as we, as we grew. And, and we were able to make some, some major strides. And so at the time we were fundamentally not diverse. Let's just be honest. Um, this industry has struggled with that, I think at times, and it tends to, you know, when you think about third party logistics, I think the first thing that often pops in your mind is trucking. Right. And so, uh, when you think about it that way, it doesn't always appeal to a broad range of people. And so we began re-establishing re how we talked about the business and, and then how we would go and hire for the business. But to get to your question, we are now uh, about a little over 20% people of color. And I think it's around 33% women. And, and so that's been, you know, you, you never sort of hit a uh, in, in Mark, uh, in that, but we're, we're really proud of the, the transformation that we're seeing happen here. And it compounds on itself because as we continue to recruit, we've been hiring at a pace of 15 to 20 people a week for a year. It feels like if, if not fully a year. Um, and when you're bringing people in for an interview and you're walking them around the office and giving them a tour, it really helps when you're, trying to make a hire where people can look around the office and see people that look like them. And it gives people a sense of comfort. Obviously, we also get to, uh, to piggyback on network effects as we bring in people. They have friends, they have acquaintances that they'll refer to us, which we appreciate. So it's really just been an amazingly eye-opening experience for us because we, we, we just kind of went into it thinking we could do better, but we weren't sure what that would look like. And, and so far, we've been pretty happy with, with the results. Well, it's nice that it's on your radar. I, I see a lot of executives or, or PR releases where I think they're just giving it lip service, but from what I can tell you, you know, it's, it's really ingrained in you as a person, it sounds like. Yeah, our, our whole leadership team. I mean, it's a very authentic uh, approach. We, we, we believe in it fully. We want it to happen, and, and we hold ourselves accountable to make sure that we are um, continuing to make progress in that regard. Well, it's interesting, and I guess I'll get your perspective as a I've never been a freight forwarder. I don't know much about the job, but you know, supply chain is you think manufacturing, moving boxes, driving trucks, it, it, that could be a reason it's male dominated. Is, is freight forwarding something that lends itself more to the female roles? I, mean, I don't know if it's relationship driven or, or more office centric or what. I'm just, just curious. You know, I, don't, I don't know necessarily if that's the case. I think that as an industry, we've come a long ways from, you know, deregulation of the 80s and, and and what those early 3PLs looked like. I mean, everything now is 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 being done digitally. Uh, there's very little paperwork. Uh, there's a lot more, it's a lot more cerebral, I think, than maybe it was in the past. And so it creates a lot more interesting jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the business that we have at Steam is way more complicated than Access America was. And I mean, but that was 15 you know years ago or so. So it should have evolved uh, during that time period, and, and, and it definitely has. But uh, yeah, we, we feel like the, just the range of services that we provide creates an environment where we can have uh, a pretty broad diversity of, of roles and jobs and functions here that can appeal to a pretty broad range of people. And yeah, that makes sense. You said, you said cerebral, more cerebral jobs. So I think women are smarter than men. Just ask my wife. So. <laughs> That's good. Now what, are you, now, what are you doing? I saw something on LinkedIn. Steve Cook, I think he, he's your, your president. Steve Cox, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Steve Cox, sorry. Um, and he, it, was, it looked, had a lot of debate from what I saw on LinkedIn. And maybe, maybe John and Mariah, we can share that if you can find it. But uh, around paying people to leave, or, or maybe I'm misquoting. What, what well, was that about? 
So it really falls under a, a broader umbrella of non-competes. We've been on a bit of a crusade as an organization to try to eliminate non-competes uh, within the space because it is a, it's a big problem. It's something that is not often talked about. And the, the prevailing model in, in our industry is you get a job and you get onboarded, you get all your new hire paperwork out of the way. And on day three, when you finally get around to signing all that stuff, they present you with a document that says, hey, if you ever leave here, you have to sit out of, of the industry. You can't go work for a competitor for, I've seen everything from three months to two years. And there's a lot of young people being hired in that fashion who are not represented by anybody from an, a legal perspective. They don't understand what they're signing and then they get locked into a job that they may want to leave someday. And then they come under tremendous pressure from their former employer's uh, legal counsel. And we just think it's a bad practice. And our we don't have a non-compete here. We never will. We believe that our job is to create an environment that people want to operate in and work in. And the, de the day that we're not doing that, then they should have the ability to go somewhere else. And we shouldn't have to hold them hostage to documents. So we are, uh, we're, we've been very outspoken about that, and Steve has been the Pied Piper of that uh, initiative, but I think the comment he was making there is, again, since we don't have a non-compete, we don't want pe people to be here that don't want to be here, and he has done things in the past where he says, hey, listen, if, if this isn't working for you, here's a, it's basically a severance. It's, hey, here's a couple thousand dollars. Don't feel like you have to stay here. We'll put you in this position to transition to somewhere else that may be a better fit, but we, will, we would rather have somebody in the seat that knows that they can do the job, who wants to do the job, and who can, who can you know, do it to the, the way that we'd like to see it happen. So it's a little tongue-in-cheek, and it's only, ha only one time ever in 20 years has anybody taken them up on it. So, but it's more about just the mindset of, hey, if you're going to be here, get everything out of this place that you can. And, uh, and, if, and if you don't, no hard feelings and, and there's no non-compete to hold you. And that makes sense. And as I said, back to the original thing, it sounds like you're literally walking the talk, you know, so that's, that's, that's where it is. But it, it yeah. created a lot of buzz, especially on LinkedIn. So maybe yeah. I'll ask the audience a couple of questions. Sorry, Jason. Sure. No, no, that's fine. Uh, I'll ask the audience some questions. Anybody haven't, I don't know if you saw the LinkedIn post, but just based on, what they talked about have you ran up in your career against an mda or what are your thoughts on them you know giving people severances if they don't think it's the right place any comments my, my associate gene, gene pledger always has positive nice things to say so but he's on mute i don't know if anybody not to put your pressure on you gene he's not listening but any uh anyone have comments on that or have questions about steam what, do we have any customers of Steam in the audience? I know we got a few uh, shippers. I don't know if anybody's on the call, Casey Harris, that uh, that uses the product or the company. We use uh, Steam for um, as a brief PL uh, at Armco. Yes. Great. Thanks. Yeah, and and Casey's in one of our classes right now, Jason. So he he actually uh, shares a lot of his experiences. It's more than just academic. So he. I mentioned that you were going to be on the call. So you said we got to join and, and let them know they're doing some good stuff. So I yeah, appreciate that very much. I expect they're happy. That's great. That's the idea. Yeah, well, sure. Now, how, how is the freight forwarding business these days? Pretty good. It is. It's, it's, uh, it's very, uh, it's very tumultuous right now. Um, you know, the past two years have been a struggle. I think, you know, the, the ocean market really drives, really everything in, in a lot of ways. And so it's been, it's been pretty upside down for a couple of years. If you start thinking back about prior to the pandemic, you could ship a 40 foot container from Shanghai to LA for $1,500, $1,600. And now you might spend 20,000. And so it's been a huge uh, challenge for the freight owners to be able to withstand this. And, and many, I think have, have struggled, but um I think one of the unique ways that that we're because of the unique way that we're structured, being able to help navigate that tough ocean market and also help navigate the drainage market, the domestic market. We've we've just seen a lot of um, support from customers who feel like we can just we can jump into their organization and be a little bit like a Swiss Army knife. There's so many things that we can do to help, uh, and at, at a time where 
all modes are suffering and and there's just a lot of noise within uh within the industry mm -hmm. and uh larry bush it looked like you were wanted to have something to say i don't know if that was just background noise or you were lighting up did you have a comment no sir so are you uh, jason are you guys regional or you know where would i be thinking about you if i lived in chicago for example we're, we're i mean we're national we're international in many ways but uh we have clients most of our clients are based uh, either in the u.s or have a major u.s presence and they're all over the place we have roughly 2500 customers that we operate with so okay and you mentioned our office openings. We, so, so right now we're in, from an office perspective, we're in Minneapolis, Birmingham, Des Moines, Detroit. We're about to open St. Louis and we're taking a hard look at Atlanta right now too, and Chicago actually. Okay. Yeah, I see we've got Steam Birmingham on the call. So yeah, I see yeah, I assume that was either an office or a, a very creative name. Yeah, we have a new office there. And um, Coincidentally, they're in the exact same office complex uh, where we were for Access America. So it's like going home again. Okay. And I, John, I don't know if you're checking the comments. I see a few of them popping up. Yeah, there are a couple of questions, Chris. Do you want to take one now? Uh, yeah, please. All right, Jason. So this is yeah. from uh, a friend of ours, a longtime friend of ours, Jim Hardiman, who asked, how do sanctions impact your contracts that you may then not be able to fulfill? Um, assuming you're talking about Russia and the Ukraine and, and that situation, we, we don't do much in that region. We are very heavy on the Trans-Pacific eastbound coming out of Asia into the U.S. And so we certainly have freight coming in and out of Europe and the Middle East and some other places. But, but, but Russia specifically is not a, not a big uh, area for us. Okay. And then the next question that we had is what sets STEAM apart from uh, some of the other big names who for many years have been offering freight forwarding, drayage, and domestic transportation. What innovations does STEAM have that move cargo that those others don't? Yeah, I, I would say what's unique about our business is that we have, we have built this company um, along the way in, in an organic way where we really have all three divisions operating in sync with one another. I think it's, first of all, it's very rare that a, um, a freight forwarder would have a very successful domestic brokerage attached to it and vice versa. And then Dreyage sort of operates in this in-between uh, segment of the, of the space that few people want to get very actively involved in it. So I think because of the way that we've built it in, in this organic matter, uh, manner over time, as opposed to through acquisition or other bolt-ons where you just naturally have silos, that gives us the ability to, to offer truly integrated solutions. So when we get on calls with customers, it's very common for us to have people inside our business representing every mode on the call, regardless if it was even meant to be a multi-modal conversation. So we may start a conversation with somebody on domestic, but we're gonna have other people in the room talking about these other modes, uh, just as a way to create a, a more dynamic conversation, help shippers understand what, what we can actually do for them and, and the full breadth of those services. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty uncommon approach that we've taken and, and we're seeing it be really embraced amongst our customers. Thank you. And then another question that just came in, what are the implications given the cost, rising cost of fuel, and what is this doing to your business strategy? Well, it is, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a huge challenge for our customers. I mean, ultimately, we're going to be passing fuel along. And so it, it's, it's an unfortunate reality, and, and there's not much we can do to mitigate how that how that comes together but it is a it's a huge hassle just as though the ocean market shipping rates have been such a hassle and obviously we we hate that for our customers but we have to just do the best we can to navigate around it yeah do we are there any shippers on the call shippers being you know people that manufacture and use shipping services are there anyone on the call because he said you know container costs have gone up to twenty thousand dollars that sounds like a lot has anybody seen their shipping rates impacted just curious from from the user side i hear about it on the news i just uh, i assume it's true 
but uh, it seems like the market's tight. It's like a supply and demand, I would assume. So I have a question for uh, another guest. I'll call him out, Don Province Province Shaw. So I'm curious. Do you think Jason knows what he's talking about here on the show? And <laughs> just uh, just to get your your professional perspective. <laughs> yeah, I think he does. I I taught him everything I know. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, good stuff. No good. <laughs> no, it's very very interesting. Thank you. So I assume I assume you're related somehow, or you just you got the name there. Just checking. No, no, I'm his dad. I'm his dad. Oh, fantastic. That's good stuff. I just I'm want to make sure dad. we got okay. Yeah, good stuff. Well, he's doing a great job. Thank you for that. Thanks for chiming Thank in. You. Thanks for listening. Now you're also so Jason, are you from Chattanooga? I know. No, I'm not. Um I I uh I went to college here and basically never left. I met my wife towards the the tail end of my time at UTC. She also went there and we uh we met and stuck around and now, 20 years of marriage and three kids later, we're still here. So, well, yeah. So, you are an alumni of UTC, and I know your the company is making an investment in the city. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What's going on? Where you'll be sure, sitting yeah. in a couple of months? Yeah. So, our offices now are in the Lifestyle Center downtown um, on Market Street, and the building directly next door to that is the, what has traditionally been called the John Ross Building, and it's been. Um, at one point, it was a, a, a car dealership, and it's a four-story, 60,000-square-foot building that we're now um, taking uh, responsibility for, and we're going to be redeveloping it and moving our headquarters into that. Um, initially, we thought we would just move the all of the Chattanooga folks in there and be done with it, but I think we're also going to keep our existing space where we are now which sits about four inches away from the other building. So we're going to build a walkway between the two and, and keep the space because we're just at, at the rate that we're hiring, we're going to need both. But, uh, but yeah, so it's, a, it's just under a $7 million investment into the city of Chattanooga. Um, and it's, uh, we've committed to hiring 400 people over the next five years as part of that. And, uh, and I think ultimately that will be a conservative number, but, but we'll at least deliver on that. Well, finding that many people is always a challenge, especially in today's labor market. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, maybe we could end with this. If you could just maybe take a couple minutes, if you can, just kind of what's your, you know, what keeps you awake at night as the CEO of a of a three PL, and kind of what's your vision? Where do you think the whole logistics market is headed? Well, I think in terms of the, the keeping up with with growth is probably what keeps me up at night. If anything, you know, when you're when you're scaling the way we are, we're reinvesting everything back into this business. There, there's always a cash flow need that you have to keep an eye on. We, we're doing very well there, but it's always an issue. Um, and so that that's something that we're constantly looking at. You mentioned hiring. We've been hiring at a fast clip, but certain markets we're struggling in. Minneapolis, for example, we would love to hire. 20 people there tomorrow, but it's just, it's been a little bit of a challenge to, to find, uh, to find people. Although our recruiting team does a, a really great job and we have, uh, you know, dedicated people doing that all day. Uh, the market itself, I think it's going to feel pretty similar to the rest of this year. I, I don't see a lot of relief coming. Um, I think it's going to, it's going to continue to be disrupted into 2023. Um, the big thing to, to watch right now is the, the longshoreman situation on the West coast that, uh, contract is up in July. If they uh, can't come to an agreement, um, it's just going to be fuel on the fire. And, and then obviously this Russia-Ukraine situation, uh, none of us needed that. That was just an unnecessary and, uh, and, and difficult thing to, to throw into the mix in an already upset uh, global supply chain. So Jason, do you, with the high cost of, of containers, have you seen any shift at all towards air freight? I know it's pretty expensive, but Yes, yes. We've uh, we've chartered multiple 747s full of goods for customers coming out of the uh, uh, Southeast Asia and, and even North China. But um, yeah, we're seeing it constantly. In fact, we were actually working on a project recently where we might have needed to charter one of those Antonov airplanes. Uh, those are the ones that are manufactured in Ukraine. So you may have seen the news, the, the, the largest one of those, there's only one in the world got uh, destroyed uh, by Russia, oh, yeah. and those things to to rebuild that is like a three year, three billion dollar project, and so it was disappointing to see that happen. But we were actually looking at maybe chartering that plane for a project we were working on that ended up not coming to fruition. But 
Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of that. Again, it's a huge expense, although the delta between air freight and ocean freight right now is as shrunk as it ever has been, uh, yeah. with, you know, historically because of the high ocean rates. Sure. Yeah, we use that in classes as an exercise to talk about, you know, cost versus speed. And obviously that's a big factor as well. Is anyone, yeah. anyone else on the call, you know, shifted towards uh, air freight at all? Just curious, as opposed to traditional ground. I think I think it's an, on the increase, but every everything's on the increase as well. So, any questions for Jason? I know we're we're backing up against the clock here in a couple minutes. Chris, we, but. we had two more questions come in through the chat, um, and and okay. both of them are both of them I think are very interesting. Uh, Jason, one is for those of us that have witnessed the explosive growth of logistics companies in the Chattanooga region. The question is, where is where is what's driving that growth? Where's that coming from? And does that mean that other cities are are losing uh, that growth segment in their their area? And then the other one is on workforce, which, as you know, is passionate, passionate mind. So, yeah. Well, I think it's been really neat to see what's happened in Chattanooga. I mean, it's, it's had a long history of, uh, of, of excellence in this, in this area. I mean, if you go back to uh, obviously U S express and covenant really set the stage for transportation companies here. And, uh, and then access America was, uh, was a, a huge influence on, on this business. I mean, we've seen um, a lot of companies pop up that, are led by Access America alumni, and and then those tentacles continue to to to, to reach out, and so uh, Steam is an example of that. So you know I don't want to uh, say it's all because of Access America, but I do think they had you know we had a, a big part in 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 establishing Chattanooga as a as a center of logistics excellence, and so uh, but there's a lot of great companies here doing great work and. You know, you, you want to capitalize on those clusters of uh, of, of opportunity. Great, right. and the next one actually, I think, kind of ties into that in a way, and it's talking about with such low unemployment, and what is Steam doing to tap into uh, talent pool when the unemployment rate is now far lower than it was even prior to the yeah. pandemic. Um, what are you guys doing to find that talent pool? We're competing, <laughs> you know, we're, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we've tried to build a, a winning culture that is people first. We, uh, we are out beating the bushes at colleges and we're going places that some people may not have put as much emphasis around, such as historically black colleges and universities. We are, uh, talking to people that we meet on the street and learning about them and talking about our business. I mean, it, it's been a all hands on deck approach. And, you know, we have roles here that don't require a college degree, which that helps to open the pool up. And, and so we, um, we are just uh, aggressively out marketing the business and, uh, and, and, and trying to get people to take a look at what we have and, and maybe challenge some of the misconceptions that they may have about our space too. Excellent. Well, Chris, I think that is all of the questions and we are one minute over. So we'll wrap up. Any final yeah, thoughts from you, yeah, Chris or Jason? Yeah, Jason, yeah, J Jason, uh, Jason's a Pied Piper. I'm ready to brush up my resume and follow him wherever he goes. <laughs> I, well, I, I, should I, have, really... I, I should have pulled up a picture of their new building. It is going to be beautiful once it's done. It's going to be quite a quite a spectacle in downtown. So well, we'll, we'll host you in it and we'll do a follow-up uh, version of this maybe uh, at, at the office if y'all want to do that. That'd be great. Hey, that would be great fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jason, Chris, thank you both so much for being a part of this. Uh, it's always great to hear what's going on in the Chattanooga supply chain community. And with that, uh, I'll give a little bit of a head up, heads up for next month. Uh, we will have Dr. Stephanie Thomas, who is a supply chain management professor at the University of Arkansas with us. And she's going to talk about another emerging trend and that is what are organizations doing to attract and retain driver talent beyond just paying them more. And so she's got some research that she's been doing that shows uh, some emerging trends. And so we're looking forward to that. So we invite you all to join us next month. Again, thank you all so much. Y'all have a great weekend. Stay safe in the snow tomorrow.
All right, thank you. Thanks Bye. again. Enjoyed it. Thank you.